Hickok 45 here. No, it's not a cat review video. The slam fire decided to jump up on the table just before we were ready to start. He so rarely makes an appearance, we thought we would uh, you know, accommodate him. I think he misses you all. And I know some of you miss him. Uh, not you cat haters, but some of you like him. He's a good old cat. He really is. Who knew a cat could be a good cat? <laughs> Big boy. <laughs> He doesn't want us to shoot these guns, I guess. Don't you realize they're pointed right at you, slam fire? <laughs> You're not being safe. I'm not being safe, letting them point at you. No, they're empty. But anyway, good to see you all. We're uh, going to look at a couple of, from the title, you probably figured that out. Uh, two 1917 revolvers, comparing them. Hopefully you have seen the video, the individual videos on each one, the Colt and the Smith & Wesson models 1917, all right? So I thought, since I have them both, I would just do a kind of a comparison of these two. Maybe just, I don't want to re, uh, recount everything we've talked about in the Colt video or the Smith & Wesson video, but just kind of a quick summary of that as well, and shoot them both. And a lot of you are probably trying to make the decision, which one of these do you want as your carry gun? Model 1917, Slamfire's lying on some of the ammo, but you know they use either a full moon clip uh, he's lying on all the half moon clips. I'll show you <laughs> when he chooses to get up. But uh, there, uh, oh, there's one, yeah. Or the half moon clips, you know, which is what they used in World War One, World War Two, and 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 after, you know. So you put two of those in instead of one of these. I don't think they had any of these until after World War One, for sure. Well, I shouldn't say for sure, but I don't think they did. Uh, sorry, slam fire. Doing your bug, you. He's going to take off now. There you go. And uh, see, I had some more there. No, he's not going far. And uh, <laughs> you listen to what I'm saying, Slam Far. You better pay attention now. Some of these people are not. They're already mad because I'm not shooting right away. You, I expect to listen. So, yeah, we're going to compare these two, take some shots. And uh, they're just great old revolvers. They just really are. A lot of people think, I believe, probably, uh, if you've not read much about them, don't know a lot about them, that, okay, World War I comes along, we get involved, and our government decides, military, hey, we need, we don't have enough 1911s, which was the case, all right? It hadn't been out that long, I think since about 1911, and we were short, you know, in terms of handguns, and so I think a lot of people think, well, they just called up Smith & Wesson and Colt, hey, could y'all make us a 45 ACP, same cartridge, a handgun, revolver, and so they both went about making them and they look a lot alike and there they are, operate pretty much the same way. Uh, very, very similar, you know, big old revolvers and uh, they chamber that 45 cold and there we go, a little difference because they're different companies and that's to be expected, a little different style, but basically the same. Well, not exactly. And that's uh, one of the myths, I guess, uh, if it is a myth, just kind of uh, clear up there. They both really uh, come from different lineage. You know, the, they, they got to where they are from different places, really, and different steps along the way. I won't belabor those steps, but then when World War I got going and we were involved in it, the rechambering them for to take the, you know, this cartridge, rimless cartridge, 45 ACP, you know, of course, very similar, and then using the uh, the clips so that they would chamber, you know how that goes. You just pop them in there, so you don't have to load the rounds individually. Pop two of those in there, and uh, there you go. And you're ready to go, they eject easily, you know, the ejector rod e ejects them, put more in. Okay, so uh, that was uh, maybe not as great as the 1911, you know, where you just put a new mag in, Pop it in, take it out, pop it in. But, uh, you know, it worked. And, you know, I, I maintain probably, and I've read that a lot of soldiers actually preferred these because most fellows, especially, that grew up firing guns and shooting were more likely to have experience with a revolver. Maybe it's these very revolvers, big old new service revolvers or the triple lock or whatever, uh, or even a 38 or whatever, more so than a 1911, of course, right? Especially World War I. And a 1911 is a different sort of animal. It's, it's harder to shoot if you don't shoot a lot of handgun. Okay, so especially back then, it's just, it just has a different feel to it. So, uh, popular revolvers, big old revolvers, just, just really desirable firearm. And of course, these are military. This is the Colt. The, uh, you know, it's got the U.S. Army 
the lanyard, uh, property of U.S. Army on the barrel and all that. Serial number in the crane on the uh, Smith, it's on the butt and the barrel and the cylinder, the serial number is. And I think on the crane you got numbers, but they are uh, assembly numbers, okay? So a little difference there. Be sure if you buy one of these, you record the right number as your serial number, okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, how, how they're similar, uh, there's some ways they are similar, right? They both fire and chamber the 45 ACP and use these clips, all right? They both came about about the same time, uh, beginning of World War One. okay? They were both used... Uh, not as much maybe on the front lines, but yeah, support personnel, some on the front lines probably had them, uh, truck drivers, uh, artillery folks, just it could have been anybody. And they were reserving as many of the 1911s they could for the, the front lines, okay? Uh, they were both five and a half inch barrel, I believe. Uh, they were you know, blue finish. They were both also uh, used by the British, and, and both of these were in versions chambered uh, in 455 Webley, you know, for, for the Brits. And uh, so, and both great guns, so they're similar in that ways. But they came about through a little bit different uh, family trees. And I'm gonna just quickly, let me shoot one of them though. Let me shoot them both, maybe. I will uh, I'll show you, uh, I'll link to both of the videos, but I'll show you how the clips work. You just Pop them in there, and and let's take a shot. Okay, and uh, I want to thank the people that help us as I take these shots. I'm going to go over here. Let me put one of these in my pocket. Going. Uh, so yeah, it shoots. Let's see if this one shoots. Let's put a full moon clip in it. It takes the uh, half moon clips. Now let's just go ahead and shoot these. Let's pretend we're in World War One, World War Two. Now this is not a magnum, but I did put a watermelon up there simply because I could, and we had one, okay? You see, that just put a hole in it. It put another hole, and there's a third hole. <laughs> it's leaking. Let's shoot a bowling pin, red one. Yeah, right on. And a real bowling pin, and how about a real two liter? <laughs> That should be all of them. And you see how simply they eject. There we go. Uh, you see how non-simply they would eject if you uh, just put rounds in here like this and fired them, which you could do. Oh no, the extractor doesn't catch them, of course. That's why you use the clips. So, uh, you know, uh, Joseph Wesson uh, supposedly invented those. He's son of Daniel Wesson. And then uh, the uh, military asked <laughs> maybe with some pressure, uh, Smith & Wesson to share that technology with Colt, okay? Because we are at war. We need all the help we can get, excuse me, and all the handguns we can get and, and rifles and everything else, okay? So they all have that in common, same method of operation, uh, just both great guns, okay? I'm trying to think of other similarities. The weight's almost similar. The uh, Smith is, I think, uh, two and a quarter pounds roughly. The Colt is two and a half pounds roughly. And uh, so the Smith is, is lighter and it, I don't know, I can't tell a lot of difference in the light. The biggest difference I feel in it is in the thinness of it. It's a little bit thinner, the grips are a little thinner, uh, even the frame is thinner. Uh, so that's one difference. So, so let's talk about a little, the, a few, before we get into too much of the differences though, I wanna, lay them out like this and show you the how they came about just briefly if I can do that briefly and of course the reason they were so uh, sought after was you know by the military was uh, you know we just didn't have enough 1911s as I said and that was true for World War II as well it rolled around and what we do we dig these things out again I read that they were probably even used more in World War II, more extensively. You know, we never have enough guns. So we, so we have dropped back and punt, and maybe these wouldn't be the first choice, but they work, they're great, great guns. So I don't have as many options to show you with the, the Smith. Let me put the Smith over here, uh, Smith & Wesson. But I do have this old uh, 38, okay? So uh, Smith & Wesson around the turn of the century, you know, late 1800s, 1900, they were developing, uh, you know, the swing out cylinder themselves. 
they you know they had been top brake guns the old smiths mainly and uh they actually copied that from colt that uh, side swing out cylinder but uh pretty much i think but they came out with their 38 uh hand ejector models you know as i talked about in that video hand ejector see with my hand i'm ejecting those rounds so there's a hand ejector i guess because you had the top brakes before that and uh, they sort of ejected automatically i don't know and then with these you had to use your hand i guess i mean seems pretty simple and obvious i guess that's why it's called a hand ejector right and so they had the 38 uh, the first model i think a second and a third i think the if i'm correct the third model hand ejector 38 yeah uh, was like this one this is a model 10 uh and it's not that old but it's a model 10 and i think it was the same frame k frame you know and it's basically you know, this gun all right so then uh, around 1907 i believe 1908 they came out with the triple lock which was a 44 uh first model hand ejector 44 hand ejector and it was the first model and it's a classic gun well made beautiful firearm it's it's highly collectible and it's called a triple lock because it locked up it was like this one but it locked up here at the crane and uh, out here at the end of the ejector rod and of course back here so it locked up in three places you know some handguns revolvers today lock up right here especially powerful ones like some of the big rugers the gp100 even uh, and other you know guns lock up right there as well. I guess maybe because they they cranked up to 44 more powerful cartridge, 44 special. The triple lock I think was introduced with the 44 special. Had been uh, I don't know if it was ever chambered. I guess it maybe was in the 44 uh, Russian. Not sure, but uh, it was famous for introducing the 44 special round, and which is a great round, and it was a beautiful gun. And uh, much like this, much like this, checkered uh, uh, grips. And I think it had a six and a half inch barrel, though most of those did. It may have been available in other barrel lengths. But that's the triple lock. They just made the, that for, I think, till about, uh, what was it, 19, uh, gosh, 15, I think. They just made that, yeah, for a, a short period of time. And not all that many of them. But uh, they're around, and I owned one long ago. So that was the first model 44 hand ejector. Then they, they, uh, Britain contacted the United States, wanted to buy some of these for you know the, the war effort. And uh, we were not in the war yet. And they wanted them chambered, and guess what? 455 Webley, right? And so Smith and Wesson, you know, did that, and. Uh, the, the Brits thought that these were a little bit overbuilt and I don't know if it was in the pricing negotiation or whatever, but that third lock on the crane, they didn't see a need for that and it was kind of involved and uh, they saw that as maybe creating more problems than fouling and fouling in combat and uh, they didn't see a need for it. So that was one of the things they changed as well as I think the shrouded, the ejector rod was shrouded up until then. So in the, the, the version two, model two of the uh, hand ejector, which is like this one, uh, they did away with the ejector rod shroud as well. They smoothed down the grip and, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, there may be some other minor changes too, but, and then chambered in, of course, 455 Webley. And the British bought like 75,000 at least of those things, maybe more. So when we entered the war, this was kind of the status you know, on this particular gun. So, uh, so Smith and Wesson chambered it in 45 ACP at the government, you know, the military's behest. They re required or re requested that. So it ended up this, pretty much, well, this gun, instead of the triple lock with the third lock and all that kind of thing, okay? So that's why this gun does not have the triple lock. It, I guess largely res the British are responsible for that, you know, you know re requesting that configuration, and it worked fine and didn't need really the, the third lock, perhaps. And so, uh, you know, that's what Smith and Weston went with, okay? And uh, this was used extensively, you know, I uh, think about 160,000 of them plus Smith made for the United States government, okay? So that's kind of where that came from, all right? And there was even a third version of the, of, uh, the hand ejector of, the, of this gun after the war, 
and I don't know where the versions of it, it, it went back to the barrel, the ejector rod shroud, and I think maybe the checker grips, I don't know. But it, it was available in some other chamberings, I think 3840 and 4440 and 45 Long Colt at various times. But a nice gun, Smith & Wesson. Okay, so that's kind of how, roughly how that came about. Now the Colt, as you know, I have more examples of it, but I'm not gonna go through all these. The uh, This is an old 1902, right? My old uh, new service revolver. Uh, Colt started making those big old swing out cylinder double action uh, new service revolvers in 1898 and just like that okay and uh, and then uh, they in 1909 uh, the military they'd been trying to get the military to take interest in it and they did in 1909 the military actually adopted this 1909 version this is a military gun here Okay, that one to be commercial. And uh, they made a couple of tweaks. They put a little more support in the grip. Uh, something about the cylinder crane. They may have changed just ever so slightly, I think. And But basically, it's just the new service revolver with, uh, you know, military markings. United States property. It's This is a military handgun, 1909. I, I really like that. It's fun to shoot, and it's 45 Colt, okay? Because this is 1909. This is prior to the ACP 45. And uh, you see the marking, so that's that's cool to have that. Now this one I brought out just because it's a uh, that's the, uh, a Canadian. The Canadians bought these, and that one's 45 Colt. It was made in 1919, and it's the same gun as well. It's a you know, for the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So 1909. So the the big old Colt revolvers have been around too, and uh, for a while. And there are lots of those. They're very popular, and so Colt. It, you know, they already basically had the revolver and they just needed to uh, adapt it to that cartridge more or less. This is the same firearm. I think they beefed up the, the barrel a little bit and, uh, and of course changed the chambering. You know, same deal. You got to have a shorter chamber because you've got the, the case rim. If I can get that. Sometimes the full moon clips are actually harder to get. So you got the thickness of that, uh, that clip and then you've got the case rim sticking out back there. So you need more space between the back of the cylinder and you know, you know the frame. All right, that's why you can't just stick one of these in a firearm that's chambered in 45 Colt very well, which I happen to have out here, don't I? Yeah, because this one's standing. Watch it go in just fine. I mean, it'll go in just fine, but yeah, it won't close up. There you go. See, I know in the first video on the Smith, I didn't have this out there. So, so yeah, obviously it's going to work, but you don't have enough room there. All right, for that to close up. All right, so then it was just a matter of, of cutting down the, uh, the cylinders here so it would take it in, of course, throating uh, the chambers. The Colt, when they first were, were made, they didn't uh, have a shoulder in there that the round could head space on, okay? So if you looked in, in other words, the shoulder, it, it squeezes down just a little bit so that when you put that in there, you know, the case adds a little thickness, of course. And so it stops on that. So you can load either one of these with just rounds like that and fire. Do you want me to do that? Loose rounds. Okay. So that's the big thing you gain. Now with the uh, uh, early Colts, I think it was up to around 50,000 in serial number. They didn't do that. And so if you put a round in there like that, it would have just fallen in to the uh, chambers and it wouldn't fire. So it's, it's nice having that shoulder. Let's put a couple more on that watermelon. Because I, when I fire these, often I don't use the clips anyway. See, a 45 ACP is, uh, you know, it's a big old slow moving bullet. It'll rock a pin. <laughs> I think I'm empty, yeah. But it doesn't just blow a watermelon like a rifle round or something or a 44 Magnum. And see, so that's what you end up with. And you can pick them out with your fingernails or you can just punch them out with something. It's not a problem. When I'm out here shooting, I just do that most of the time. I'm glad to load those clips. The, the, the soldiers didn't really have to load the clips, as I understand. They, of course, that ammo came to them in the clips and they probably just, you know, toss that. But, uh, so that shoulder was kind of nice. It is nice. All of them didn't have it. The first ones did not have it. Smith started using that right from the beginning. But uh, as I understand, some of them, I was watching, uh, who was it, Othias on uh, 
Matthias and May on uh, C and Arsenal, and he actually had an old one that uh, yeah, the rounds went right through it, uh, so there was no shoulder in there. And his Smith and Wesson supposedly didn't make any like that, but apparently they did, right? So, but they were generally known uh, to have that early on, right from almost the beginning. Okay, so uh, that's that's kind of uh, where they came from, and then they're similar and they're different. Uh, the uh, I was trying to think. Let me let me shoot the Smith again before I get too carried away here. Do you mind if I uh, am not historical and I put one of these in here? Uh, okay <laughs> yeah i you know i'm i have a hard time deciding which one i like better i like them both boom double action yeah let's go double again <laughs> nice old revolvers and fun to shoot those of you who have fired big bore revolvers you know what i'm talking about and uh it's really more fun than a 44 Magnum because you don't have that, that big recoil, but you got a big bullet you're slinging out there, right? And uh, so in terms of the differences, you know, uh, they're just, they're, they're, uh, this one is lighter. Let me show you the difference in the thickness on the, uh, the, the grip is a little thinner. And let me put this on the, the Colt. You see that, you can tell by as you look at them, but okay, there's your Colt thickness, the whole frame. And then when you put that on the Smith, look at the space you got there, okay? And that's that's the entire frame is thinner, that much thinner. And in the barrels, I think I showed you. Uh, I may be repeating myself. I've been playing with these things so much and talking about them, and I enjoy them so much. But uh, it, it seems like it ought to be almost a pound lighter, but it's really not because there is less steel in it. And uh, into that barrel is just so dramatically different. But uh, the uh, other differences uh i talked about the chamberings the chambers and uh, the sights as you can tell the uh half moon sight and you got a sharper sight i don't know which i like better that's got a nice uh pointed sight picture but this isn't bad either since somebody painted it like me i get a pretty good sight picture the uh the rear groove on both of them is pretty narrow so not the ideal combat sight but they get the job done they really do and they're, they're both 1917, or wait a minute, this one's made in 1918. This one was made in 1917, but they're both, you know, model 1917s, used in World War I, uh, quite possibly, and World War II in some capacity, because they dragged them out. There were almost 200,000 of them put in mothballs after World War I, and then they dragged them out for World War II again. We were still short of handguns and uh, didn't have enough of the 1911s and uh they refurbished them the ones that needed it and uh you know fixed them up cleaned them this one uh they re they parkerized some of them because i think they all started out with a blue finish and this one appears to have been parkerized and so this one uh, apparently was refurbished uh, for world war ii i guess and so if they again if these things could talk you know telling the stories they could tell very very effective guns and uh and very very desirable if you like revolvers they're just really cool uh you got historical value historical significance put it that way i don't think in terms of value as investment as much as just the the really the cool factor you know the cool factor where they've been like the old colts i talk about single actions we don't know exactly where they've been but we do know these were probably probably both used in both world wars and maybe other places they use these in vietnam some in, uh, in the tunnel rats and things i read so you just never know where they've been and they're so shootable and uh, and fun to shoot and you can load them individually like i said with the half moon clips full moon clips and you know have fun with them the uh yeah, as I said in the other videos, you know, the Smith was, a lot of those were bought by Brazil, 25,000 of them. You'll see some of those around on surplus market. Uh, you'll see both of these around. They're not like rare, rare, uh, but you don't run into them every day. They're not crazy expensive, but they're not cheap. And they're just fun to shoot. And they shoot a very common cartridge. Uh, let me shoot both of them one more time and see if I like one of them better than the other as far as shooting. How's that? I'll put moon clips in this one, and I think I'll just because uh, that's what I've got. I'll load them both up and lay them here. 
like I've done with some other firearms. And and uh, if you're thinking about one of these as your carry gun, uh, I'm just gonna clink some shots here. Feel pretty good. The Colt. Okay, this one's a Smith. All right. The verdict is my carry gun will maybe be the Colt. It doesn't jump as much. It doesn't hurt me as much back here. But that's partly because my large hands, and this one's a little thinner. It's a little lighter, so the recoil maybe hits me a little more. This one with the fatter grips uh, feels a little bit better. Okay. They're both loaded with empty cases, aren't they? Because I fired six out of each one of them. Uh, so your choice, you know, I don't know. It's, it's just tough. It's, it's tough. I know you have to make that choice because you're going to be carrying one of these. <laughs> but uh, great shooters, uh, 1917, model 1917. They came from kind of uh, different branches. And then they met at World War One. And uh, read about the history. You know, watch... Uh, Forgotten Weapons, Ian, you know, or Othias, like I say, uh, they go into incredible detail on firearms like this. And if you really, really are fascinated by these kinds of firearms, uh, there's just so much information, you know, out there in print and in video. Uh, hopefully we whet your appetite a little bit and that you, you know, watch them and you know, let you see them being shot and give you an impression of that as well. But uh, just rich, really rich in, in history the uh, model 1917 and uh, I don't know if that was any use to you or not but I sure had fun doing it life is good oh yeah that's better this is a great gun for defense oh hey didn't see you guys there uh, while I've got you here I want to remind you of our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballastall Talon Grips makes uh, grips can you believe it uh, for all different types of firearms you can get rough texture or more of a rubberized texture uh, just sticks right on there, you know, really affordable, really cool option to in, improve the grip for your handguns um, or, or rifles. Uh, so please check them out at talongungrips.com. You'll be glad you did. And also Ballastol. Uh, Dad has been using Ballastol for many years. It's a cleaner and a lubricant, and it's non-toxic. Uh, it works really great, and we're happy to have them on board since it's been a part of our shooting endeavor for a very long time. So go to ballastall.com talongungrips.com and also while you're out there I'm juggling all these things here also uh, while you're on the internet please do check out our other social media like Hickok45 on Facebook there's also Hickok45 on Twitter the real Hickok45 on Instagram there's a John underscore Hickok45 on Instagram where I do some things there's Hickok45.com uh, you can find us also on GunStreamer so check out all that stuff and then watch more videos